Part 3. Pittsburgh wasn't really Andrew Carnegie's town. We just thought it was. Steel wasn't the only major industry in Pittsburgh. We just had to think to recall the others. Andrew Carnegie started out in Pittsburgh as a tiny bobbin boy and ended up a tiny millionaire. He was only five feet three. When he was 24, having scrambled, he became a superintendent of the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Whenever Rex blocked the railroad tracks, Carnegie showed up to supervise. He hopped around the wrecked freight cars, he ordered the big workmen to lay tracks around the wrecks, or even, quick, to burn the wrecks to save the schedule. He liked to tell about one such night when an enormous, unknowing Irish workman picked him straight up off the ground and set him aside like a gate, booming at him. Get out of the way, you brat of a boy. You're eternally in the way of men who are trying to do their job. The Carnegies emigrated from Scotland when Andrew was 13, a bookish family of lowland Scots radicals, they championed universal suffrage and hated privilege and hereditary wealth. As a child, he recalled, I could have slain king, duke, or lord, and considered their death a service to the state. When later, Edward the Seventh offered him a title, he refused it. The then fashionable suburb of Homewood, where young Carnegie moved with his mother in 1859, was part of an old estate. The center of life there was the estate house of 80-year-old Judge William Wilkins and his wife, Math Matilda. Wilkins had served in government under three presidents and returned to Pittsburgh. Mah Matilda Wilkins was a, from a prominent family whose members had served in two cabinets. The Civil War was then heating up, and the talk one social evening was of Negroes. Young Carnegie was among the guests. Miss Wilkins complained of Negroes' forwardness. It was disgraceful, she said. Negroes admitted to West Point. Oh, Miss Wilkins, Carnegie piped up. He was then only in his twenties, but a man of convictions, which he didn't shed when he visited the, get the great house. There is something even worse than that. I understand that some of them have been admitted to heaven. There was a silence that could be felt, Carnegie recalled. Then, dear, Miss Wilkins said gravely, that is a different matter, Mr. Carnegie. Carnegie started making steel. He wrote four books. He preached what he called American style, the gospel of wealth. A man of wealth should give it away for the public good and not weaken his sons with it. The man who dies rich dies disgraced. In 1901, when he was 66, Carnegie sold the Carnegie Company to J.P. Morgan for $480 million. His share came to $250 million. Carnegie added this sum to his considerable other wealth he had built a special steel room in Hobroken, New Jersey, to house the bulky paper bonds, pesky things, and set about giving it away. He managed to get rid of 350 million of it before he died. In 1919, leaving for himself while he lived, and family when he died, very much less than tithe. Carnegie's top steelmen were share-owning partners, 40 of them, most of whom had worked their way up from the blast furnaces, smelters, and rolling mills. When J.P. Morgan bought the company he called U.S. Steel, these forty split the rest of the take and became instant millionaires. One went to a barber on Penn Avenue for his first shampoo. The barber reported that the washing brought out two ounces of fine masabi ore and a scattering of slang and cinders. Carnegie gave over forty million to build 2,509 libraries, and the early libraries had graven out their doors, Let There Be Light. But a steel worker, speaking for many, told an interviewer, We didn't want him to build a library for us. We would rather have had higher wages. At the time, steel workers worked 12-hour shifts on floors so hot they had to nail wooden platforms under their shoes. Every two weeks, they toiled an inhuman 24-hour shift, and then they got their sole day off. The best housing they could afford was crowded and filthy. Most died in their 40s or earlier from accidents or disease. Workers' lives were almost unbearable in Dusseldorf then, too, and in Lills, and Birmingham, and Ghent. It was the Gilded Age. When Carnegie was visiting Scotland in 1892, his men, Henry Clay Frick, had loosed, loosed 300 hired guns, Pinkertons, on unarmed strikers and their families at the homestead plant up the river. Strikers, who subsequently beat the daylights out of the Pinkertons with their fists. Frick then called in the entire state militia, 8,000 strong, whose army occupation of the homestead plant not only broke the strike, but also killed, killed all unions in the steel industry nationwide 
until 1936. Pittsburgh's astonishing wealth came from iron and steel, and also from aluminum, glass, coke, electricity, copper, natural gas, and the banking and transportation industries that put up the money and moved the goods. Some of the oldest Scotch-Irish and German families in Pittsburgh did well, too, like the sons of Scotch-Irish Judge Mellon. Andrew Mellon, a banker, invested in aluminum when the industry consisted of, t- of a 22-year-old Oberlin College graduate who made it in his family's woodshed. He also invested in coke, iron, steel, and oil. When he was named Secretary of the Treasury, quiet Andrew Mellon was one of the three Americans who had ever amassed a billion dollars. Carnegie's strategy was different. He followed the immortal dictum, put all your eggs in the one basket and watch that basket. By the turn of the century, Pittsburgh had the highest death rate in the United States. That was the year before Carnegie sold his steel company. Typhoid fever epidemics recurred because Pittsburgh's council members wouldn't filter the drinking water. They disliked public spending. Besides, a water system would need a dam, and a dam would yield cheap hydroelectric power, so the power companies would buy less coal. Coal company owners and their bankers didn't want any dams. Pittsburgh epidemics were so bad that boatmen on the Ohio River wouldn't handle Pittsburgh money for fear of contagion. While Carnegie was unburdening himself publicly of his millions, many people were moved, understandably, to write for him letters. His friend Mark Twain wrote him one such. You seem to be in prosperity. Could you lend an admirer a dollar and a half to buy a hymn book with? God will bless you. I feel it. I know it. P.S. Don't send the hymn book. Send the money. Among Andrew Carnegie's benefactions was Pittsburgh's Carnegie Institute, with its school, Carnegie Tech, Library, Museum of Natural History, Music Hall, and Art Gallery. This is my monument, he said. By the time he died, he occupied, it occupied 25 acres. It was a great town to grow up in, Pittsburgh, with 1,000 other Pittsburgh school children. I attended free art classes in Carnegie Music Hall every Saturday morning for four years. Every week, seven or eight chosen kids re- reproduced their last week's drawings in thick chalks at enormous easels on stage in front of the thousand other kids. After class, everyone scattered. I roamed the enormous building. Under one roof were the Music Hall, Library, Art Museum, and Natural History Museum. Late in the afternoon, after the other kids were all gone, I liked to draw hours-long pencil studies of the chilly marble sculptures in the Great Hall of Classical Sculpture. I sat on one man's plinth and drew the next man over until, during the course of one winter, I had worked my way around the Great Hall. From these sculptures, I learned a great deal about the human leg, and not much about the neck, which I could hardly see. I ate a basement cafeteria lunch and wandered the fabulous building. The Natural History Museum dominated it. I felt I was most myself here, here in the church-like dark-lighted by painted dioramas in which tiny shaggy buffalo grazed as far as the eye could see on an enormous prairie I could span with my arms. I could lose myself here. Here in the church-like dark-lighted by painted dioramas in which tiny shaggy buffalo grazed as far as the eye could see on an enormous prairie, I, I could span with my arms. I could lose myself here, here in the cavernous vault with the shadow of a tyrannosaurus skeleton spread looming all over the domed ceiling. The skeleton's shadow enlarged the size of the Milky Way, each bone a dark star. There was a Van de Graaff generator. You could make a bright crack of lightning strike and it from a rod. From a vaulted ceiling hung a cracked wooden stiff, the sole boat of the Ciceris III, which Carnegie had picked up in Egypt. Upstairs there were stuffed songbirds in drawers and empty faded birdskins in drawers, drab as old handkerchiefs. There were the world's insects on pins and needles, their legs hung down, utterly dead. There were big glass cases you could walk around, in which in various motionless American Indians made baskets, started fires, embroidered moccasins, painted pots, chipped spearheads, carried papooses, smoked pipes, drew bows, and skinned rabbits, all of them wearing soft and pale, doe-skinned clothing. The Indians looked stern, even to the children, and had bright red skin. I never thought to draw them. They weren't sculptures. Sometimes I climbed the broad marble stairs to the art gallery. Carnegie's plans for the art gallery had gone somewhat awry gang agley because its first curator was a scottish irish pittsburger whose rearing had made it painful for him to spend money he rarely acquired anything that cost over twenty five dollars and liked to buy wee drawings almost any drawings in bargain batches 
two for ten, three for twenty. By my day, things had improved enormously, and the gallery would buy even large abstract expressionist canvases if the artists were guaranteed famous enough. Our school hauled us off to the art gallery once a year for the international exhibition, but I rarely visited it on my Saturdays in the building, except when Man Walking was there. Carnegie set up the international exhibition in 1896 to bring contemporary art from all over the world each year to the art museum. Artists competed for a prize, and the museum's curators could buy what they liked if they felt they could afford it, or if they liked any of it. In 1961, Gometsky's sculpture, Man Walking, won the International. I was 16. Everything I knew outside the museum was alien to me then, and for the next few years until I left home. I saw the sculpture, a wiry thin person, long legs in full stride, thrust his small mute head forward into the empty air, six feet tall, bronze. I read about the sculpture every time I opened the paper. I saw its picture. I climbed the marble stairs alone to look at it again and again, to see man walking. I walked past abstract canvases by Robert Motherwell, Franz Klein, Adolf Gottlieb. I stopped and looked at their paintings. At school, I began to draw abstract forms in rectangles and squares. But more often than for many years, I drew what I thought of as the perfect person, whose form matched his inner life, and whose name was Indian style, man walking. I saw a stilled figure in a swirl of invisible motion. I saw a touchy man moving through a still void. Here was the thinker in the world, but there was no world, only the abyss through which he walked. Man walking was a pure consciousness made poignant, a soul without a culture, absolutely alone, without even a time, without people, speech, books, tools, work, or even clothes. He knew he was walking, here. He knew he was feeling himself walk. He knew he was walking fast and thinking slowly, not forming conclusions, not looking for anything. He himself was barely there. He was in spirit, in, in form, a dissected nerve. He looked freshly made of clay by God, visibly pinched by sure fingertips. He looked like Adam, depressed, as if there were no world. He looked like Ahasuerus, condemned to wander without hope. His blind gaze faced the vanishing point. Man walking was so skinny, his inner life was his outer life. It had nowhere else to go. The point where his head met his spine was the point where spirit met matter. The sculptor's soul floated to his fingertips. I met him there, on man walking skin. I drew man walking in his normal stalking pose, and later dancing with his arms in the air. What if I felt in love with a man, and he took his shirt, took off his shirt, and I saw he was man walking made of bronze, with Gaio Cometti's thumbprints on him? Well, then I would love him more, for I knew him well. I would hold, if he let me, his twisted head. Week after week, year after year, after art class, I walked to the vast museum and lost myself in the arts or the sciences. Scientists, it seemed to me as I read the labels on display cases, Bevolves, Univolves, Eugaletes, Legomorphs, were collectors and sorters, as I had been. They noticed the things that engage the curious mind, the way the world develops and divides, colony and poip, population and tissue, ridge and crystal. Artists, for their part, noticed the things that engage the mind's private and idiosyncratic interior, that area where the life of the senses mingles with the life of the spirit, the shattering of light into color, and the way it shades off round a bend. The humble attention painters gave the shadow of a stalk or the reflected sheen under its chin, or the lapping layers of strong strokes included and extended the scientist's vision of each least thing as unendingly interesting. But artists laid down the vision in the form of beauty bear, man-walking, radiant and fierce, inexplicable and without the math. It all got noticed, the horse shoulders pumping, sunlight warping the air over a hot field, the way leaves turn color brightly cell by cell, and even the splitting half-resigned and half-astonished feeling you have when you notice you are walking on earth for a while now, set down for a spell, in this particular time, for no particular reason, here. As a child, I read hoping to learn everything, so I could be like my father. I hoped to combine my father's grasp of information and reasoning with my mother's will and vitality. But the books were leading me away. They would propel me right out of Pittsburgh altogether, so I could fashion a life among books somewhere else. So the Midwest nourishes us. Pittsburgh is Midwest's eastern edge, and presents us with the spectacle of a land, 
and a people, completed and certain. And so we run to our bedrooms and read in a fever, and love the big hardwood trees outside the windows, and the terrible Midwest summers, and the terrible Midwest winters, and the for forested f river valleys with the blue Appalachian Mountains to the east of us, and the broad Great Plains to the west. And so we leave it sorrowfully, having grown strong and restless by opposing with all our will, and mind and muscle, its simple, loving, single will, will for us, that we stay, that we stay and find a place among its familiar possibilities. Mother knew we would go. She encouraged us. I had awakened again, awakened from my drawing and reading, from my exhilarating game playing, from my intense collecting and experimenting, and my cheerful friendships to see on every side of me a furious procession of which I had been entirely unaware, a procession of fast-talking, keen-eyed, high-stepping, well-dressed men and women of all ages had apparently hoisted me or shanghaied me some time ago and were bearing me breathless along. I knew not where. This was the startling world in which I found that I had been living all along. Packed into the procession, I pedaled to keep up, but my feet only rarely hit the ground. The pace of school life quickened, its bounds tightened, and a new kind of girl emerged from the old. The old-style girl was obedient and tidy, the new style girl was witty and casual. It was a small school, 20 in a class. We all know who mattered. Not only in our class, but in the whole school. The teachers knew too. In summer, we girls commonly greeted each other after a perfunctory hello by extending our forearms side by side to compare tans. We were blonde, we were tan, our teeth were white and straightened, our legs were brown and dilapidated. Our blue eyes glittered pale in our dark faces. We laughed, we shuffled the cards fast and dealt four hands. It was not for me. I hated it so passionately I thought my shoulders and arms swinging at the world would split off from my body like loose spinning blades and fly wild and slice everyone up. With all my heart sometimes I longed for the fabled Lower East Side of Manhattan, for Brooklyn, for the Bronx, where the thoughtful and feeling people in the books grew up on porch stoops among seamstress intellectuals. There I belonged, if anywhere. There were the book people there, recent Jewish immigrants, everybody deep every live-long minute. I could just see them, sitting there, deeply. Here, instead, I saw polished fingernails, clicking, rings, slashing, gold bangle bracelets banging and ringing together. As sixteen-year-old girls like me pushed their cuticles back, as they ran combs through their just-washed, just-cut, just-set hair, as they lighted Marlboros with hard snaps of heavy lighters and talked about other girls or hair. It never crossed my mind that you can't guess people's lives from their chatter. This was the known world. Women volunteered, organized the households, and reared the kids. They kept the traditions and taught by example a dozen kinds of love. Mother polished the brass, wiped the ashtrays, stood barefoot on the couch to hang a picture. Margaret Butler washed the windows, which seemed to yelp. Mother dusted and polished the big philodendrons tenderly, leaf by leaf, as if she were washing babies' faces. Margaret came sighing down the stairs with an armful of laundry or waste baskets. Mother inspected the linens for a party. She fetched from the closet, folding felted boards she laid over the table. Margaret turned on the vacuum cleaner again. Mother and Margaret clanged the sheets and pillowcases. Then Margaret left. I had taken by then to following her from room to room, trying to get her to spill the beans about being black. She kept moving. Nothing changed. Mother wiped the stove. She ran the household with her back to it. You heard a staccato in her voice and saw the firm force of her elbow as she pressed hard on a dried, tan dot of bean soup and finally took a fingernail to it while quizzing Amy about a carpool to dancing school and me about a ride back from a game. No page of any book described housework, and no one mentioned it. It didn't exist. There was no such thing. A woman at our country club, a prominent figure at our church, whose daughters went to Ellis, never washed her face all summer to preserve her tan. We rarely saw the pale man at all. They were pulling, off, pulling down the money on which the whole scene floated. Most men from home, exhausted in their gray suits, to scantily clad women smelling of bain de soleil, and do-nothing tanned kids in madras shorts. There was real beauty to the old idea of living and dying where you were born. You could hold a place in a kind of eternity. Your grandparents took you out to dinner on Sunday nights at the country club, and you could take your own grandchildren there when the time came. More little toeheads, as squint-eyed and bony-legged and Scot-Irish as hillbillies. And those grandchildren, 
like figures in a real and endlessly unreeling, would partake in the same timeless, hushed, muffled sensations. They would join the buffet line on Sunday nights in winter at the country club. I remember the club lounges before dinner, dimly lidded and opulent like the church, the wool rugs absorbing footsteps, the lined damask curtains slapping thickly across tall, leaded glass windows. The adults drank old fashions. The fresh-haired children subsisted on bourbon-soaked maraschino cherries, orange slices, and ice cubes. They roved the long corridors in slippery shoes. They opened closet doors, tried to get outside, laughed so hard they spit their ice cubes, and made sufficient commotion to rouse the adults to dinner. In the big dining room, layers of fine, old, unstarched linen draped the tables as thickly as hospital beds. Heavy-bottomed glasses sank into the tablecloth soundlessly. And semi-paternal, too, were the summer dinners at the country club, the sun-shocked people, sonnabalistic as angels. The children's grandchildren could see it. Space and light multiplied the club rooms. The damask curtains were heavy black. The French doors now gave out into a flagstone terrace overlooking the swimming pool near the sixth hole. On the terrace, men and women drank frozen daiquiris or the unvarying scotch, and their crystal glasses clicked on the glass tabletops and then stuck in pools of condensation as it if held magnetically, so they had to skid the glasses across the screeching tabletops to the edges in order to raise them at all. The cast-iron chair legs painted white, marked, and chipped the old flagstones and dug the interstitial grass. The dressed children on the terrace looked with longing down on the tanned and hilarious children below. The children below wouldn't leave the pool, although it was 7.30. They knew no parent would actually shout at them from the flagstone terrace above. When these poolside children jumped in the water, the children on the terrace above could see their shimmering gray bodies against the blue pool. The water knit a fabric of light over their lively torsos and limbs. A loose gold chain mail. They looked like fish swimming in wide gold nets. The children above were sunburnt, and their cotton dresses scraped their shoulders. The outsides of their skin felt hot, and the insides felt cold. They tried to warm one arm with the other. In summer, no one drank old fashions, so there was nothing for children to eat till dinner. This was the world we knew best. This, and Oma's. Oma's world was, un- was no likely alternative to ours. Oma had a chauffeur, and her chauffeur had to drink from his own glass. My forays into Oma's world changed. I was working in the summers now. The summer I sold men's bathing suits, I ate lunch alone in a dark bar and played the numbers for a quarter every week, right there in the underworld. I no longer went to the lake with Amy. But for a few spring vacations after our grandfather died, Amy and I visited Oma and Mary in their apartment in Pompado Beach, Florida. On my last visit, I was 15. Everything I was required to do, sit as such in a table with other people, either bored me to fury or infuriated me to a kind of benumbed lethargy. I was finding it difficult to live, finished with everything I knew and ignorant of everything else. I woke every morning full of hope and was livid with rage before breakfast at one thing or another. Oma and I argued that year over a word, because something I was talking about seemed to require it. Oma said the word for padded, upholstered furniture was overstuffed. I wouldn't hear of it, having never heard of it. It's not overstuffed, it's stuffed just right. Oma pointed out that it was just barely possible that she knew something on earth that I didn't. I couldn't quite believe her. In Oma's Pompado Beach apartment, I lounged on the bright print bamboo furniture and looked at the Asian objects she had been collecting all her life. Gaudy Chinese cleonase lamps, lacquered chests, sentimental Japanese porcelain figurines, women in white face with cocked heads and pink circles on their cheeks, gold bossed mirrors, foot-long yellow ashtrays shaped like carp, and a pair of green ceramic long-tailed birds, which took the, up the breakfast table. It was years before I learned that Asian art was supposed to be delicate. In Florida, Mary Berinda drove the machine. Oma rode in the front seat. Amy and I sat in the back. That year, Oma's current row seat Cadillac had an extra row of upholstered seats, which folded against the front seat's back, like, but not very like, the extra seats in the cab and especially a long distance stretched between the front seat and the back. One day, when we were driving back from Miami, Oma had been looking at shoes. Oma had announced at breakfast, Today I want to look at shoes, and I repeated the phrase to myself all morning, marveling to learn what it might feel 
like to want to look at shoes. Without prevocation, she broke down, grieving for her grandfather. She rubbed her round face in her hands. Mary at the wheel, expulsated, shocked. Mrs. Doak, oh, Mrs. Doak, she added. That was two years ago, Mrs. Doak. This occasioned a fresh outburst, which broke our hearts. I saw Oma's red hair and her lowered head wipe back and forth. Then she rallied and began defensively. But you know he was never cross with me. Never once, someone ventured from the depths of his back seat. Well, once, yes, once. Her voice lightened. They were driving, she said, on a high mountain road. I saw the back of her round head swivel. She was looking up and away, remembering. The two of them were driving along a dreadful road, she said. A perfectly horrible road, in Tennessee, maybe. Her voice grew shrill. There was a sheer drop just outside my window, and I thought we were going over. We were going over, I tell you. She was furious at the thought, and he got very cross with me. She said he had never seen him so angry. He said I could either hush or get out and walk. Can you imagine? She was awed, so was I. We were both awed, that he had dared. It cheered everyone right up. The bird watching was fine in the nearby Fort Lauderdale City Park. Right in the middle of town, the park was mostly wild forest, with a few clearings and roads. Oma and Mary drove me to the park early every morning and picked me up at noon. There, I saw some of the few smooth-billed anis in the United States. They were black parrot-beaked birds. They hung around the park's dump. The binoculars I wore banged against my skinny ribcage. I filled a notebook with sketches, information, and records. I saw myrtle warb warblers in the clearing. I saw a coot and a purple gallinile side by side, just as Peterson had painted them in the field guide. They swam in a lagoon under sea grape trees. They seemed, as common birds seem to the delirious beginner, miraculous and rare. The tizzy that birds excite in the, in the beginner are a property of the beginner, not of the birds. So those who love the tizzy itself must ever keep beginning things. Often, I was startled to see, through binoculars and flattened by their lenses, glimpsed through the dark subtropical leaves, the white hull of some pleasure cruiser setting out on a Lauderdale canal. Who would go cruising behind houses and lawns when he could be watching a smooth-billed anise? I alone was sane, I thought, in a world of crazy people. Standing in the park's smelly dump, I shrugged. Afternoons, I wandered in the blinding beach, swam, and read about tide pools in Maine. I was reading The Edge of the Sea. On the beach, I found skeletons of vanilla, or by the wind sailors. From the high apartment windows, I looked at the lifeguards around the pool below and wondered how I might meet them. By day, Oma and Mary shopped. Evenings, we went out to dinner. Amy was as desperately bored as I was, but I wouldn't let her follow me. I addressed her in French. Everyone knew this was our last Florida trip. It was on this visit that Oma asked me, when we were alone, what exactly it was that homosexuals did. She was miffed that she'd been unable to command this information before now. She said she'd wondered for many years without knowing who she could ask. Amy and I boarded our plane back to Pittsburgh. It would be softball season at school, and a new baseball season for the Pirates, whose hopes were resting on a left-handed reliever, Elroy Face, and on the sober starter, Vernon Law, the deacon, and on the big bat of our right fielder, Roberto Clemente, whom everybody in the world adored. Flying back, looking out over the Blue Ridge, I remember a game I had seen at Forbes Field the year before. Clemente had thrown from right field to the plate as apparently easily as a wheel spins. The ball seemed not to arc at all. The throw caught the runner from third. You could watch this man at inning's end, lope from the right field to the dugout, and you'd weep at the way he jo his joints moved and the ease and power in his spine. I was ready for all that, but it was only late March and snowing in Pittsburgh when we got off the plane and dark. At least we were tan. When I was 15, I felt it coming. Now I was 16 and it hit. My feet had imperceptibly been set on a new path, a fast path into a long tunnel, like those many turnpike tunnels near, near Pittsburgh. Turnpike tunnels whose entrances bear on brass plaques a roll can of those men who died blasting them. I wandered witlessly forward and found myself going down and saw the light dimming. I adjusted to the slant and dimness, traveled further down, adjusted to greater dimness, and so on. There wasn't a whole lot I could do about it or about anything. I was going to hell in a handcart. That was all. And I knew it. And everybody around me knew it. And there it was. I was growing and thinning as if pulled. 
I was getting angry as if pushed. I morally disapproved most things in North America and blamed my innocent parents for them. My feelings deepened and lingered. The swift moods of early childhood, each formed by and suited to its occasion, vanished. Now feelings lasted so long they left stains. They arose from nowhere like winds or waves and battered on me and engulfed me. When I was angry, I felt myself coiled and longing to kill someone or bomb something big. Trying to appease myself during one winter, I whipped to my bed every afternoon with my uniform belt. I despised the spectacle I made in my own eyes, whipping the bed with a belt like a creature demented. And I often began half-heartedly, but I did it daily after school, as a de desperate discipline, trying to rid myself in the innocent world of my wildness. It was like trying to beat back the ocean. Sometimes in class I couldn't stop laughing. Things were too funny to be bored. It began then, my surprise, that no one else saw what was funny. I read some books with such reference that I didn't close them at the finish, but only moved the pile of pages back to the start, without breathing, and began again. I read one such book, an enormous novel, six times that way, closing the binding between sessions, but not between readings. On the piano, in the basement, I played the maniacal Poet and Peasant Overture so loudly for so many hours, night after night, I damaged the piano's keys and strings. When I wasn't playing this crashing overture, I played Boogie Woogie or something else, anything else, in octaves. Otherwise, it wasn't loud enough. My fingers were so strong, I could do push-ups with them. I played one piece with my fists. I banged on a steel string guitar till I bled. And once, on a particularly piercing rock and roll downbeat, I broke straight through one of my father's snare drums. I loved my boyfriend so tenderly, I thought I must transmogrify into vapor. It would take spectroscopic an an analysis to locate my molecules in thin air. No possible way of holding him was close enough. Nothing could cure this bad case of gentleness except perhaps violence. Maybe if he swung at me by the legs and split my skull on a tree. Would that ease this insane wish to kiss too much his eyelids' outer corners and his temples as if I could love up his brain? I envied people in books who swooned. For two years, I felt myself continuously swooning and continuously unable to swoon. The blood drained from my face and eyes and flooded my heart. My hands emptied, my knees unstrung. I bit at the air for something worth breathing, but I failed to fall, and I couldn't find the way to black out. I had to live on the lip of a waterfall, exhausted. When I was bored, I was first hungry, then nauseated, then furious, then weak. Calm yourself, people had been saying to me all my life. Since early childhood, I had tried one thing and then another to calm myself. On those few occasions when I truly wanted to, eating helped, singing helped. Now, sometimes, I truly wanted to calm myself. I couldn't lower my shoulders. They seemed to wrap around my ears. I couldn't lower my vo voice, although I could see the people around me flinch. I waved my arm in class till the very teachers wanted to kill me. I was what they called a live wire. I was shooting out sparks that were digging a pit around me and I was sinking into that pit. Laughing with Ellen at school recess, or driving around after school with Judy in her Jeep, exultant, or dancing with my boyfriend to Louis Armstrong across a polished dining room floor, I got so excited I looked around wildly for aid. I didn't know where I should go, or what I should do with myself. People in books split wood. But when rage or boredom reappeared, each seemed never to have left. Each so filled me with so many years' intolerable accumulation, it jammed the space between my eyes, so I couldn't see. There was no room left, even on my surface, to live. My ribcage was so taunt I couldn't breathe. Every cubic centimeter of atmosphere above my shoulders and head was heaped with last straws. Black hatred clogged my very blood. I couldn't peep. I couldn't wiggle or blink. My blood was too mad to flow. For as long as I could remember, I had been transparent to myself, unselfconscious, learning, doing most of, ev most of every day. Now I was in my own way. I myself was a dark object I could not ignore. I couldn't remember how to forget myself. I didn't want to think about myself, to reckon myself in, to deal with myself every live-long minute on top of everything else. But swerve as I might, I couldn't avoid it. I was a boulder, blocking my own path. I was a dog, barking between my own ears. A barking dog who wouldn't hush. This, so this was adolescence. Is this how the people around me had died on their feet, inevitably, helplessly? Perhaps their own selves eclipsed the sun for so many years, the world shriveled around them, and when at last their inescapable orbits had passed through these dark 
egoistic years. It was too late. They had adjusted. Must I then lose the world forever that I had so loved? Was it all the whole bright and various planet where I had been so ardent about finding myself alive, only a passion peculiar to children, that I would outgrow even against my will? I quit the church. I wrote the minister a fierce letter. The assistant minister, kindly, Dr. James H. Blackwood, called me for an appointment. My mother happened to take the call. Why, she asked, would he be calling you? I was in the kitchen after school. Mother was leaning against the pantry door, drying a crystal ball. What, Mama? Oh, probably, I said, because I wrote him a letter and quit the church. You what? She began to slither down the doorway. Weak-kneed, like Lucille Ball. I believe her whole life passed before her eyes. As I climbed the stairs after dinner, I heard her moan to Father. She wrote the minister a letter and quit the church. She what? Father knocked on the door of my room. I was the only person in the house with her own room. Father ducked under the doorway, entered, and put his hands in his khaki pockets. Hi, Daddy. Actually, it drove me nuts when people came in my room. Mother had come in just last week. My room was getting to be quite the public arena. Pretty soon, they'd put it on the streetcar routes. Why not hold the U.S. Open here? I was on the bed, in uniform, trying to read a book. I sat up and folded my hands in my lap. I knew that Mother had made him come. She listens to you. He had undoubtedly been trying to read a book, too. Father looked around, but there wasn't much to see. My rock collection was no longer in evidence. A framed tiger swallowtail spread, and only slightly skew on white cotton hung on a yellowish wall. On the mirror, I'd taped a pencil portrait of Rupert Brooke. He was looking off softly, balanced on top of the mirror, were some yellow and black fallout shelter signs, big aluminum ones, which Judy had collected as a part of her anti-war effort. On the pale maple desk, there were, among other books and papers, an orange thesaurus, a blue three-ring binder with a boy's name written all over it in every typeface, a green assignment notebook, and Emerson's essays. Father began with some vigor. What was it you said in this brilliant letter? He went on. But I didn't see that people did these things quietly, just quietly, no fuss, no flamboyant gestures, no uncalled-for letters. He was forced to conclude that I was deliberately setting out to humiliate Mother and him. And your poor sisters, too, Mother added feelingly from the hall outside my closed door. She must have been passing at that very moment. Then immediately we all heard a hideous shriek ending in a wail. It came from my sister's bathroom. Had Molly cut off her head? It set us all back, a moment. Me on the bed, father standing by my desk, mother outside the closed door, until we all realized it was Amy, mad at her hair. Like me, she was undergoing a trying period, years long. She, on her part, was mad at her hair. She screeched at it in the mirror. The sound carried all over the house, kitchen, attic, basement, everywhere, and terrified the rest of us every time. The assistant minister of the Shadyside Presbyterian Church, Dr. Blackwood, and I had a cordial meeting in his office. He was an experienced, calm man in a three-piece suit. He had a mustache and wore glasses. After he asked me why I had quit the church, he loaned me four volumes of C.S. Lewis broadcast talks for a paper I was writing. Among the volumes proved to be The Problem of Pain, which I would find fascinating, not quite serious enough, and too short. I had already written a paper on the book of Job. The subject scarcely seemed to be closed. If the all-powerful creator directs the world, then why all this suffering? Why did the innocents die in the camps, and why do they starve in the cities and farms? Addressing this question, I found 30 pages written thousands of years ago, and 40 pages written in 1955. They offered a choice of fancy language saying, forget it, or serenely worded logical-sounding answers that so strained credibility. Pain is God's megaphone. That forget it seemed, in comparison, a fine answer. I liked, however, C.S. Lewis's efforts to diffuse the question. The sum of human suffering we didn't, needn't worry about. There is plenty of suffering, but no one ever suffers the sum of it. Dr. Blackwood and I shook hands as I left his office with his books. This is rather early of you to be quitting the church, he said, as, as if to himself, looking off and went on mildly almost inaudibly. I suppose you'll be back soon. Humph, I thought. Pshaw. Now it was May. Daylight saving time had begun. The colored light of the long evenings fairly split me with joy. White triolum had bloomed and gone on the forested slopes in Fox Chapel. The cliffside and riverside patches of woods all over town showered translucent ovals of yellow or ashy greens. 
The neighborhood trees on Gled Arnid Drive had blossomed in white and red. Baseball season had begun. A season which recalled but could never match last year's National League pennant and seventh game World Series victory over the Yankees, when we at school had been so frenzied for so many weeks, they finally and wisely opened the doors and let us go. I had walked home from school one day during that series and seen Pittsburgh Fifth Avenue emptied of cars as if the world were over. A year of wild feelings had passed, and more were coming. Without my noticing, the drummer had upped the tempo. Someone must have slipped him a signal when I wasn't looking. He'd speeded things up. The key was higher, too. I had a driver's license. When I drove around in Mother's old Dodge convertible, the whole town smelled good, and I did drive around the whole town. I cruised along the blue rivers and across them on steel bridges, and steered up and down the scented hills. I drove winding into and out of the steep neighborhoods across the Elgany River. Neighborhoods where I tried in vain to determine what languages the signs on the storefronts were written. I drove into boulevards, highways, beltways, freeways, and the turnpike. I could drive to Guatemala, drive to Alaska. Why, I asked myself, did I drive to all the spots on earth, a garage? Why home? Why school? Throughout the long, deadly school afternoons, we junior and senior girls took our places in study hall. We sat at desks in a room full of desks, whether or not we had something to do, until four o'clock. Now, this May afternoon, a teacher propped open the study hall's back door. The door gave on to our hockey field, and behind it, Pittsburgh's Nabisco plant, whence, oh lordy, issued the smell of shortbread today. They were baking L Lorna Dunes. Around me sat forty or fifty girls in green cotton jumpers and spring uniform white bucks. They rested their chins on the heels of both hands and leaned their cheeks on curled fingers. Their propped heads faced the open pages of L'Etranger, Hamlet, Vanity Fair. Some girls leaned back and filed their nails. Some twisted stiff pieces of their hair to say not much awake as alive. Sometimes in health class, when we were younger, we had all been so bored we hooked our armpits over our chair backs, so we cut off all circulation to one arm in an effort to kill that arm for something to do, or cause a heart attack, whichever came first. We were, in fact, getting a dandy education, but sometimes we were restless. Weren't there some wars being fought somewhere that I, for one, could join? I wrote a name on a notebook. I looked at the study hall ceiling and tried to see that boy's familiar face, light and dark, bold-eyed, full of feeling, on the inside of my eyelids. Failing that, I searched for his image down the long spectacled tunnel or corridor I saw with my eyes closed, as if visual memory were a Marx Brothers comedy. I glimpsed swift fragments, a wry corner of his lip, a pointed knuckle, a cupped temple, which crossed the corridor so fast I recognized them only as soon as they vanished. I opened my eyes and wrote his name. His depth and complexity were apparently infinite, from the tip of his lively line of pattern to the bottom of his heartbroken, hopeful soul was the longest route I knew, and the best. The heavy, edible scent of shortbread maddened me in my seat, made me so helpless with the longing my wrists gave out. I couldn't hold a pen. I looked around constantly to catch someone's eye, anyone's eye. It was a provocative fact, which I seemed to have discovered, that we students outnumbered our teachers. Must we then huddle here like sheep? By what right exactly did these few women keep sitting here keep us sitting here in this clean, bare room to no purpose. Lately, I had been trying to inflame my friends with the implications of our greater numbers. We could pull off a riot. We could bang on the desks and shout till they let us out. Then we could go home and wait for dinner. Or we could dare our teachers off our shoulders and what? Throw them in the Lorna Dune better. I got no takers. I had finished my work long ago. Work only, work only on what interests her. The accusation ran, as if I reflected obedience outraked passion, as if sensible people didn't care what they stuck in their minds. Today, as usual, no one around me was ready for action. I took a fresh sheet of paper and copied on it in random lines in French. Au saison, au chateau. Is it through these endless nights that you sleep in exile? O million go golden birds. O future vigor. Oh, that my keel would split. Oh, that I would go down in the sea. I had struck upon the French syllabisms like a canyon of sharp crystals underground, like a long and winding corridor lined with treasure. These poets popped into my ken in an odd way. I found them in a book I had rented from a drugstore. Carnegie and school libraries filled me in. I read Enid Starkey's Rimbaud biography. 
I saved my allowance for months and bought two paper-bound poetry books, The Penguin, Rimbond, and a symbolist anthology in which Paul Valéry declaimed, Azur, c'est moi. I admired Gerald de Neville. This mad writer kept a lobster as a pet. He walked it on a leash along the sidewalks of Paris, saying, It doesn't bark, and it knows the secrets of the deep. I loved Rimbaud, who ran away, loved his skinny, furious face with the wild hair and, shake and snaky, unseen eyes pointing in two directions, and his poems, confusion and vagueness, their overwritten longing, their hatred, their sky-shot lyricism, and their oracular fragmentation, which I enhanced for myself by reading and retaining his stuff in crazed bits, mostly from Le Baton Livre, The Drunken Boat. The Drunken Boat tells its own story, a downhill, downstream, epic, unusually full of words. Now in study hall, I saw that I had drawn all over this page. I got out another piece of paper. Rimbaud was was damned. He said so himself. Where could I meet someone like that? I wrote down another part. There is a cathedral that goes down and a lake that goes up. There is a troop of strolling players in costume, glimpsed on the road through the edge of the trees. I looked up from the new page. I had already started to draw all over. Except for my boyfriend, the boys I knew best were out of town. They were older, prep school and college boys, whose boldness, wit, breadth of knowledge, and absence of scruples fascinated me. They cruised the dead party circuit all over Pennsylvania, holding every younger girls up to the light like chocolates to determine how rich their centers might be. I smiled to recall one of these boys. He was so accustomed to the glitter of society and so sardonic and graceful that he carried with him at all times in his jacket pocket a canister of dance wax. Ordinary boys carried pocket knives for those occasions which occur unexpectedly, and this big, dark-haired boy carried dance wax for the same reason. When the impulse rose, he could simply sprinkle dance wax on any hall or dining room floor, take a girl in his arms, and whirl her away. I had known these witty, handsome boys for years, and only recently understood that when they were alone, they read books. In public, they were lounge lizards, they drank, they played word games, filling in the blanks, desultorily. They cracked wise. These boys would be back in town soon, and my boyfriend and I would join them. Whose eye could I catch? Everyone in the room was bent over her desk. Ellen Ha was usually ready to laugh, but now she was working on something. She would call me as soon as we got home. Every day on the phone, I unwittingly asked Ellen some blunt question about the social world around us, and at every question she sighed and said to me, You still don't get it. Or often, as if addressing a jury of incredulous peers, she still doesn't get it. Looking at the study hall ceiling, I dozed myself um, almost fatally with the oxygen-eating lines of Verlaine's The Long Sobs, of the violins of Autumn, wound my heart with a languor monotone. This unsatisfying bit of verse I repeated to myself for ten or fifteen minutes by the big clock, over and over, clobbering myself with it, the way Molly, when she had been a baby, banged on the top of her head on her crib. Oh, world, oh, college, oh, dinner, oh, unthinkable task. Funny how badly I'd turned out. Now I was always in trouble. It felt as if I was doing just as I'd always done. I explored the neighborhood, turning over rocks. The latest rocks were difficult. I'd been in a drag race, of all things, the previous September, and in the subsequent collision, and in the hospital, my parents saw my name in the newspapers, and their own names in the newspapers. Some boys I barely knew had cruised by that hot night and said to a clump of us girls on the sidewalk, Anybody want to come along for a drag race? I did, absolutely. I loved fast driving. It was then, in the days after the drag race, that I noticed the ground spinning beneath me, all bearings lost, and recognized as well that I had been loose like this, detached from all I saw, and knowing nothing else for months, maybe years. I whirled through the air like a bull roarer spun by a lunatic who'd found his rhythm. The pressure almost split my skin. What else can you risk with all your might but your life? Only a moment ago, I was climbing my swing set, holding one cold metal leg between my two legs tight and feeling a piercing oddness run the length of my gut, the same sensation that plucked me when my tongue touched tarnish on a silver spoon. Only a moment ago, I was gluing squares of paper to rocks. I leaned over the bedroom desk. I was drawing my baseball mitt in the attic, under the plaster-stained ship, a pencil study took all Saturday morning. I was capturing the flag, 
turning the double play, chasing butterflies by the country club pool. Throughout these many years of childhood, a transparent sphere of timelessness contained all my runnings and spinnings, as a glass paperweight holds flying snow. The sphere of this idol broke time, unrolled before me in a lime. I woke up and found myself in juvenile court. I was hanging from crutches. For a few weeks after the drag race, neither knee worked. No one else got hurt. In juvenile court, a policeman wet all ten of my fingerprints on an ink pad and pressed them one by one, using his own fingertips on a form for the files. Turning to the French is a form of suicide for the American who loves literature. Or, as the joke might go, it is at least a cry for help. Now, when I was sixteen, I had turned to the French. I flung myself into poetry, as into Niagara Falls. Beauty took away my breath. I twined away. I flew off with my eyes rolled up. I dove down and succumbed. I bought myself a plot in Valerie's Marine Cemetery and moved in. Cool dirt on my eyes, my brain smooth as a cannonball. It grieves me to report that I tried to see myself as a sobbing fountain, apparently serene, tall, and thin, among the chill marble monuments of the dead. Rimbaud wrote, wrote a lyric that gently described a man sleeping out in the grass. The sleeper made a peaceful picture until the poem's last line, we discover, in his right side, two red holes. This, and many another liter literary false note, appealed to me. I had been suspended from school for smoking cigarettes. That was a month earlier, in early spring. Both my parents wept. Amy, Amy saw them weeping. Horrified, she began to cry herself. Molly cried. She was six, missing her front teeth. Like mother and me, she had pale skin that turned turgid and red when she cried. She looked as if she were dying of wounds. I didn't cry, because actually, I was an intercontinental ballistic missile with an atomic warhead. They don't cry. Why didn't I settle down, straighten out, shape up? I wondered, too. I thought that joy was a childish condition that had forever departed. I had no glimpse, then, of its return, the minute I got to college. I couldn't foresee the pleasure or the possibility of shedding sophistication, walking away from rage and renouncing French poets. While I was suspended from school, my parents grounded me. During that time, Amy began to visit me in my room. When she was thirteen, Amy's beauty had grown inconspicuous. She seemed merely pleasant-looking and tidy. Her green uniform jumper fit her neatly. Her thick hair was smoothed, un her turned under. Her white McCullen collars looked sweet. She had a good eye for the right things. People respected her for it. I think that only we at home knew how spirited she could get. Oh, no, she cried when she laughed hard. Oh, no, Amy adored our father, rather as we all did, from afar. She liked boys whose eyebrows met over their noses. She liked boys emphatically. She followed boys with her big eyes, odd. In my room, Amy listened to me rant. She reported her grades daily gossip, laughed at my jokes, cried, Oh, no, and told me about the book she was reading, Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White. I liked people to tell me about the books they were reading. Next year, Amy was going to boarding school in Philadelphia. Mother had no intention of subjecting the family to two adolescent maelstroms whirling at once in the same house. Late one night, my parents and I sat at the kitchen table. There was a truce. We were all helpless and tired of fighting. Amy and Molly were asleep. What are we going to do with you? Mother raised the question. Her voice trembled and rose with emotion. She couldn't sit still. She kept getting up and roaming around the kitchen. Father stuck out his chin and rubbed it with his big hands. I covered my eyes. Mother squeezed white lotion into her hands over and over. We all smoked. The ashtray was full. Mother walked over to the sink, poured herself some ginger ale, ran both hands through her short blonde hair to keep it back, and shook her head. She sighed and said again, looking up, and out of the night black window. Dear God, what are we going to do with you? My heart went out to them. We all seemed to have exhausted our options. They asked me for fresh ideas, but I had none. I racked my brain, but couldn't keep up with anything. The U.S. Marines didn't take 16-year-old girls. Outside the study hall that May, a cardinal sang his round-noted song, and a robin sang his burbling song, and I slumped at my desk with my heart pounding, too harried by restlessness to breathe. I collected poems and learned them. I found the British war poets, World War I, Rupert Brooke, Edmund Blunden, Siegfried Sassoon, and especially Wilfred Owen, who wrote bitterly without descending to sarcasm. 
I found Asian and Middle Eastern poetry in translation, whole heaps of lyrics, fierce or limp, which I rippled to fragments for my collection. I wanted beauty, bare of import. I liked language in strips, like penance. Under the spell of Rimbaud, I wrote a poem that began with a line from Une saison en affaire. Once, if I remember well, and continued, my flesh did lie confined in hell. It ended, slantingly to my own admiration, and in my filth did I lie still. I wrote other poems, luscious ones, in the manner of the Song of Songs. One teacher, Miss Hickman, gave her lunch hour to meet with us about our poems. It galed me that adults, as a class, approved the writing and memorization of poetry. Wasn't poetry secret and subversive? One sort of poetry was full of beauty and longing. It exhaled, enervated, and helpless, like Li Po. Other poems were threats and vows. They inhaled. They poured into me a power I could not spend. The best of these, a mounted Arabic battle cry, I recited to myself by the hour, hoping to trammel the teacher's drone with hoofbeats. I dozed myself with pure lyricism. I lived drugged on sensation, as I had lived alert on sensation as a little child. I wanted to raise armies, make love to armies, conquer armies. I wanted to swim in the stream of beautiful syllables until I tired. I wanted to bust open the Ellis School with my fist. One afternoon at Judy Scheuer's house, I saw a white paperback book on a living room chair, Lucretus on the Nature of Things. Lucretus, said the book's back cover, had flourished in the first century B.C. This book was a prose translation of a long poem in Latin hexameters, the content of which was ancient physics mixed with philosophy. Why was this book in print? Why would anyone read wrong science, the babblings of a poet in a toga? Why, but from disinterested intellectual curiosity? I regarded the white paperback book as if it had been a meteorite smoldering on the chair's silk upholstery. It was Judy's father's book. Mr. Scheuer loaned me the book when he was finished with it, and I read it. It was deadly dull. Nevertheless, I admired Judy's lawyer father boundlessly. I could believe in him for months at a time. His recreation proceeded from book to book, and had done so all his life. He had, I recalled, majored in classical history and literature. He wanted to learn the nature of things. He read and memorized poetry. He quizzed us about current events. What is your opinion of our new Supreme Court justice? On the other hand, his mother's family were Hollyoaks, and he hadn't raised a hand to rescue Judy from having to come out in Salem, Massachusetts. She had already done so, and would not talk about it. Judy was tall now, high-waisted, graceful, messy still. She smiled forgivingly, smiled ironically, behind her thick glasses. Her limbs were thin as stalks, and her head was round. She spoke softly. She laughed at anything chaotic. Her family took me to the ballet, to the Pittsburgh Symphony, to the Three Rivers Arts Festival. They took me skating on a frozen lake in Highland Park and swimming in Ohio Ohiofile, south of town where the Yukohione River widens over the flat rock outcrops. After school, we piled in Judy's Jeep. Out of the Jeep's open back, I like to poke the long barrel of a pop gun slowly and aim it at the drivers of the cars behind us and shoot the cork, which then swung from its string. The drivers put up their hands in mock alarm or slumped ob- obligingly over their wheels. Pittsburghers were wonderful sports. All spring long, I crawled on my pin. I was reading General Semantics, Alfred K- Korsky B's early stab at linguistics. I'd hit on it by accident in books with the word language in their titles. I read Froude's standard works, which interested me at first, but they denied reason. Denying reason had gotten rimbod nowhere. I read without snobbery, excited and alone, wholly free in the indifference of society. I read with pure, exhilarating greed of readers sixteen, seventeen years old. I felt I was exhuming lost continents and plundering their stories. I knocked open everything in sight. Henry Miller, Helen Keller, Hardy, Updike, and the French. The war novels kept coming out, and so did John O'Hara's. I read popular social criticism with Judy and Ellen. The Ugly American, The Hidden Persuaders, The Status Seekers. I thought social and political criticism were interesting, but not nearly so interesting as almost everything else. Ralph Waldo Emerson, for example, excited me enormously. Emerson was my first crack at Platonism. Platonism, as it had come bumping and skidding down the centuries and across the ocean to Concord, Massachusetts. 
Emerson was a thinker full-time, as Pastor and Salk were full-time biologists. I wrote a paper on Emerson's notion of the soul, the oversoul, which I could banish from my mind, the thought of galoshes, one big galosh in which we have our time being, it was grand stuff. It was metaphysics, at last, poetry, with import, philosophy minus the Bible. And Emerson incited to riot, flouting every authority, and requiring each native to cobble up an original relation with the universe. Since rioting seemed to be my specialty, if only by default, Emerson gave me heart. An aerovated, fanatic, filled long past bursting with oxygen, I couldn't use. I hunched skinny in the school's green uniform, elucidated, broken, bellicose, starved over the back of over the back breaking desk. I sighed and sighed, but never emptied my lungs. I said to myself, O oh, breeze of spring, since I dare not know you, what part of the silk curtains by my bed? I stuffed my skull with poems' invisible syllables. If unauthorized persons looked at me, I'd hoped they'd see blank eyes. On one of these May mornings, the school's headmistress called me in and read aloud my teacher's confidential appraisals. Madame Owens wrote an odd thing. Madame Owens was a sturdy, affectionate, and humorous woman who had lived through two world wars in Paris by eating rats. She had curly black hair, rouge cheeks, and long, sharp teeth. She swathed her enormous body in thin, thin black fab fabrics. She sat at her desk with her tiny ankles crossed. She chatted with us. She reminisced. Madame Owen's kind word on my behalf made no sense. The headmistress read it to me in her office. The statement began unforgettably. Here, alas, is the child of the twentieth century. The headmistress, Marion Hamilton, was a brilliant and strong woman who I liked and respected. The school's small-minded trustees would soon run her out of town on a rail. Her black hair flared from her high forehead. She looked up at me significantly, raising an eyebrow, and repeated it. Here, alas, is the child of the twentieth century. I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what to do about it. You got a lot of individual attention at a private school. My idea was to stay barely alive, pumping blood and exchanging gases just enough to sustain life, but certainly not enough so that anyone suspected me of sentience. Certainly not enough so that I woke up and remembered anything, until the time came when I could go. C'était la petite morte derrière les rosiers. It is she, the little girl dead behind the rose bushes. The child left on the jetty washed out to the sea. The little farm child following the lane, whose forehead touches the sky. During classes all morning, I drew. Drawing deliberately, as I learned to do, yielded complex, fresh drawings. The inevitable backs of my friends' heads, their ankles limp at rest over their winter-brown Oxfords, the way their white shirts' shoulders emerge from their uniform jumpers. I roused myself to these efforts only once or twice a day. I drew man walking, too. During the other six or seven hours, when I wasn't fiddling with poetry, I drew at random. Drawing at random, paying no attention, infuriated me, yet I never stopped. For years as a child, I drew faces on the back of my left hand, on the top of my knees. In my green assignment book, my blue canvas three-ring binder. Later, I drew rigid faces on the Latin textbook's mazy printed page, down and across the spaces between lines and words. I drew stretchable cartoons on the wiggly and problematic plane of a book's pages' edges. Those page edges, pressed slats and slits, could catch and hold your pen the way streetcar tracks caught and held your bike wheel. They threw you off your curve. But if you overcame this hazard, you could play at stretching and squeezing the Holgarthy face. I drew inside a textbook's illustrations, usually on the bare sky, or on the side of a building or cheek. When I was very young, I sometimes drew on my fingernails, and hated myself for it. I drew at home, too. My lines were hesitant. You make everything out of hair, Amy complained. It was always faces. I drew faces and bodies. Men and women, old and young. Mostly women, and many babies. The babies grew as my sister Molly did. They learned to walk. At Ellis, Molly was in the second grade. The little kids didn't wear uniforms. She wore pretty dresses. I was a forward on the basketball team. Standing around in front of the school, I used to dribble Molly. She bounced, hopping under my hand. We both thought it was mighty funny. During class, I drew her hopping in a smock dress. If I didn't draw, I couldn't bear to listen in class. Drawing siphoned off some restlessness. One English teacher, Miss McBride, let me sit in the back of the classroom and paint. I paid no attention to the drawings. They were like mannerisms, obsessive, careless, grotesque. My hand gibbered out these 
like drool. When I did notice them, they repelled me. Mostly, these people were monstrous, elongated, or compressed. Some were cross-hatched to invisibility, cross-hatched till the paper dissolved into wet lint on the desk. They were swollen of eyelid or lip. Megalophesic, haughty, moribund, manic, and mostly contemplative, lips shut, full-lidded eyes, downcast as serene as I was excited. They wore their ballpoint pen hair, every which way. They wore ill-fitting hats or melting eyeglasses. They wore diapers and ruffled pants, striped ties, brassieres, eye patches, pearls. Some were equipped with hands-on, which they rested their weary heads, or which they waved shockingly up at me. Very often, I connected these unwittingly formed people by a pen line, leading from the contour of a neck or foot to a drawing of the pen that drew the line, and thence to my carefully drawn right hand holding the pen in my arm in my sleeve. I love bending my thoughts down that pen line and up that weird trail connecting and separating the conscious and unconscious, the wiggly hair half-fashioned and the sly full-fashioned, and fashioning hand. More than once on family visits far away, or on the streets where I walked to school or at Forbes Field, I saw a stranger whom I recognized. How well I knew that face and its bee-stung lips, its compressed forehead, its clumsy jaw. And I realized then, with a draining jolt of superstitious dread, that I was seeing in the flesh someone I had once drawn, someone I had once drawn with a ballpoint pen inside a matchbook or on an overcrowded page, a scribbled face inside the lines of a photographed woman's skirt. Now here was that face perfectly molded and fleshed in, as private as the drawing, and as sad walking around on a competent body apparently experienced here and at home. Outside the study hall the next fall, the fall of our senior year, the Nabisco plant baked sweet white bread twice a week. If I sharpened a pencil at the back of the room, I could smell the baking bread and the cedar shavings from the pencil. I could see the oaks turning brown on the edge of the hockey field and see the gorged silver sky above shining a secret, true light into everything, into the black cars and red brick apartment buildings of Shadyside, glimpsed beyond the trees. Pretty soon, all twenty of us, our class, would be leaving. A core of my classmates had been together since kindergarten. I'd been there eight years. We twenty knew by bored heart the very weave of each other's socks. I thought unfairly of the polyphemous moth crawling down the school's driveway. Now, we'd go too. Back in my seat, I repeated the poem that begun, We grow to the sound of the wind playing, his flutes in our hair. The poems I loved were in French or translated from Chinese, Portuguese, Arabic, Sanskrit, Greek. I murmured their heartbreaking syllables. I knew almost nothing of the diverse and energetic city I lived in. The poems whispered in my ear the password phrase, and I memorized it behind enemy lines. There is a world. There is another world. I knew already that I would go to Holland's College in Virginia. Our headmistress sent all her problems there, to her alma mater. For the English department, she told me. William Golding was then writer in residence. Before him was Enid Starkey, who wrote the biography of Rimbaud. But, to smooth off her round edges, she had told my parents, they repeated the phrase to me vividly. I had hoped for my rough edges. I wanted to use them as a can opener, or to cut myself a hole in the world's surface, and exit through it. Would I be ground in, instead to a numb? Would they send me home an ornament to my breed, and a jewelry bag? I was in no position to comment. We had visited the school. It was beautiful. It was at the foot of Virginia's Great Valley, where the Scotch-Irish had settled in the 18th century, following the Algonese South. 